Thank you, ladies. That was so lovely. I wanted to fall on my knees. I did. Um, during that hymn, we're, we're called to fall on our knees. And um, this whole evening, um, this whole theme for this evening is about that, actually, which is a blessing. I do want to say, um, for those of you who do not know, Pastor Phil had rotor cuff surgery a few weeks back. And um, I know many of you do know that, but some of you are our guests tonight, so you don't know that. I wanted to let um, you all know that he's doing well, and he plans on preaching on Sunday, a week from today. Um, you know, Pastor Phil is such an amazing man. Um, he spends anywhere really from 10 to 14 hours preparing one message. So really, it's not the getting up here and delivering the message that, you know, that's the easier piece of what he does. Um, it's the preparation, and he hasn't been able to be up to doing that. And so that's why it's taken a while. This does take a while for recovery, but I have to tell you, as his wife, I have always been blessed to be able to serve the servant. And he is a servant, and to be able to bless him in that manner. And I just, I just want to like challenge you to try to open a bottle of water with one hand, because that's what like he is one hand limited right now. He has to keep his arm at his side for quite a while and um, for many weeks in order for that part of the process of healing to take place. So um, I have been serving him so that he can heal properly, and it has been my honor and my blessing to serve your pastor and my pastor. Um, so keep him in prayer, and keep him in prayer this week, because he's going to need that time to um, really get focused in and study hard to prepare the word for you. Um, let me pray really quick. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that we are here tonight to focus on our Savior, our Redeemer, the one in who came to save. We thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that the teaching tonight drop as the rain, and my speech will distill as a dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim that you, O Lord, are great. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, on the program t tonight, you'll notice that Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55 are there. This portion of scripture in Luke has been called the Magnific Magnificent. And um, the Lord just put it on my heart to just put it on one side if you wanted to even frame that or post that. Um, I have to tell you, um, because I haven't had hours and hours and hours to prepare this for tonight. Um, I have actually used this portion of scripture as my devotions for the last month. So I'm up here just sharing with you uh, my devotions and what the Lord showed me through this portion of scripture. And it is so rich. It is so filled with majesty. And so um, I just want to... Um, tell you that I'm blessed that you're here tonight because it's a busy time of year and to take time to just come and sit um, and be a part of this evening um, I want to thank you for that um, and it's been my heart's desire for about six weeks and I've been praying this pretty much every morning as I do my devotions in this portion of scripture that not only um, you but myself would leave here tonight desiring to know our Savior in a deeper way because that's what it's all about. And so, um, again, this year's theme is based on Mary's Magnificent, and it's recorded here in the Gospel of Luke, verses 46 through 55. And I just want to read to you what Matthew Henry's commentary said on just this. It's just a little portion, so just, you know, he said, it is, a very, it is very good for those who have the work of grace begun in their souls to communicate one to another. On Mary's arrival, Elizabeth was conscious of the approach of her who was to be the mother of the great Redeemer. You see, in the same chapter of Luke, the, ga the angel Gabriel came to Mary, announced that she was going to conceive a child through the Holy Spirit, 
And that child was going to be named Christ, and he, was come, he has come, the Messiah. And then after she hears that news, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth. So this is what Matthew Henry is expounding on right here. At the same time, she was filled with the Holy Ghost and under his influence declared that Mary and her expected child were most blessed and happy, as peculiarly honored of and dear to the Most High God. Mary, animated by Elizabeth's address and being so under the influence of the Holy Spirit, broke out into joy, admiration, and gratitude. She knew herself to be a sinner who needed a savior, and that she could no otherwise rejoice in God than as interested in his salvation through the promised Messiah. You see, those who see their need of Christ are desirous of righteousness and life in him, and he will fill them with good things, with the best things, and they are abundantly satisfied with the blessings that he gives. He, O oh, the Lord, will satisfy the desires of the poor in spirit who long for spiritual blessings while the self-sufficient shall be sent away. I thought that was interesting. And, of course, Mary, that's what Mary's singing about. So let us read together these verses, and I'm just going to go verse by verse. Um, and you have that in front of you. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones, and he has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. If you were to go back to 1 Samuel, there's a wonderful young girl named Hannah whose womb was closed. And after the Lord had opened her womb and she conceived a child, she sprung forth into a song of joy and adoration. And it is recorded in 2 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 10. And if you were to study, and I encourage you to do so, both of those texts, they're very similar I thought that was a sweet touch of the Holy Spirit because he does that. The Holy Spirit, through the word, writes through those people, and it all blends together. Hannah and Mary were both women who magnified the Lord. Mary was extolling the Lord, and she was worshiping him. She was so overwhelmed by the joy of carrying the Messiah, the Redeemer, and having Elizabeth bear witness to that, as she, you know, went into Elizabeth's presence, she just broke out into adoration, magnifying him. And this heart of exaltation and a heart of an adoration toward the Lord is consistent throughout the scriptures. If you are to look and identify people who just broke out into thanksgiving or even into a prayer out of being anxious or fearful, whatever, they always break out declaring the Lord and his goodness and worshiping him. In 1 Samuel 2 verse 1, Hannah prayed, My heart exalts the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord, and my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. In Psalm 34, verses 2 and 3, the psalmist says, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. As you study the prayers of the Bible, you will notice that they start out with worship and adoration and glory to God. And they begin by proclaiming God's greatness. 
Now the Song of Mary is an entire prayer of worship. These 10 verses that we are looking at tonight is an entire prayer to the Lord in its complete worship. There's not one request, nor supplication, nor intercession. It is just praise to God. And I ask you, when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you just went before the Lord and didn't ask him for anything, didn't request anything, didn't intercede on behalf of anybody, but just spent your time in praise and worship? Mary begins, my soul magnifies the Lord. In other words, Mary saying, all that is within me, you know, within the depths of my being, within the core of my heart, I declare your greatness, O Lord. Her deep, passionate love for the Lord is expressed as a woman who lifts the Lord high. Are you a woman who lifts the Lord high? I'm going to ask you a lot of questions because when I do my devotions through Scripture, I ask myself questions. So I'll be throwing out some questions. She magnified and extolled him in the depth of her being. Magnified is defined as extol or laud, to cause to be held in greater esteem or respect, to increase in significance, to intensify. Do you extol the Lord in your prayers, in your conversations in life? Do you extol the Lord? I always do try I, whenever an opportunity arises, whether I be at work or whether I be talking with um, a neighbor, a friend, genuinely, I don't do it f in a fake manner, but genuinely try to extol the greatness of God in that conversation and how good he's been to me. And if you are born again and saved and you have surrendered your life to the Lord, that is your story. That is the greatness of God. You can share that with people. You can say, God is great. You know why? Because he saved me. Me, this nothing of a person, this person who is a sinner. He saved me because he is so good and so loving. And you can extol him for that. I encourage you to make a habit to begin your times of prayer just magnifying and extolling him, and even taking a separate time during the day to just do that and not ask for anything. Well, Mary goes on in verse 47 to say, And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. You know, Mary's joy and rejoicing is rooted in God her Savior. That's where it's rooted. And I see two key points in this verse. Firstly, how important it is for our joy to be rooted in Jesus, in our Savior. The joys of Christmas season, and they make me happy. I've always had beautiful memories at Christmas time in my family and, um, and with friends. And, and so, you know, it's very, it's a fun time for me. It happens to be for me personally. But, you know, I was thinking about that. The season comes and it goes. And the joys that influx my life, they come and go too. But my Jesus remains. Your Savior remains. The circumstances of our lives can rob us of our joy. And, you know, I, years ago I did an acronym of joy, and it is Jesus Our Yearning. And he must be our yearning. And when Jesus is our yearning, we, no matter what circumstances are going on in our lives, we will have that inner joy, that joy that is there not because of the circumstances, but because of Jesus being my yearning. And secondly, I see in this verse that Mary made Jesus her personal Savior. The word my in that verse just leaped off the page when I was doing my devotions. It cried out. You see, she, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the one who carried him in her womb, needed him as her Savior. She had a personal relationship with Jesus. She, was, she knew that Jesus was coming was developing in her womb, and she needed him for her salvation and nothing else, not anything in her goodness, 
not any good works or any religious sacraments. We didn't see any of this in this verse, in this portion of scripture. We didn't see her thanking him for making her such a good person that she can go to heaven. We don't see that. We only see that the word my redeemer, my savior comes out. She makes him her personal savior. The child, Jesus, that was developing in her womb Jesus, the Messiah, the long-awaited Redeemer, was hers as a Savior, as a Savior. And I think if Mary, who carried the baby Jesus in her womb, needed him as her Savior, we need him as our Savior to go to heaven. We see Elizabeth also expressing her need for the Savior in the verses preceding this Magnificent. We see in verse 42 and 43 of this portion, it's right above this portion of Scripture, Elizabeth says, But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, again, personalizing the word my, my Lord should come to me. How amazing. Verse 48, Mary goes on to say, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. You know, God regards the lowly and the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to those who are humble. You know, Mary knew her worth apart from God, apart from her Savior, was nothing. That she was nothing apart from Jesus. And it was because of Jesus that she would be known to be the blessed one that was chosen to carry the Savior of, a, of the world. That's what made Mary so known, so famous. Until the end of time, she would be known. Why? Not for her good works. Not, and she was a sweet, sweet woman throughout. You know, I mean, she was actually a young teenager at this time. That's not why. It was because she carried the Savior of the world. And God, she knew that God regarded the low and humble because she was lowly. D.L. Moody said this, and I love it. He said, God has two thrones, one in the highest heavens, the other in the lowliest heart. You know, God selects the simple and humble life to use for his glory. Do you feel like you have nothing to offer God, or you have nothing to offer the people around you, that's kind of good. Because you know, God regards the lowly. God regards those who have a simple life. You know, this verse tells us that Mary's not worthy to be prayed to. She's not worthy to be worshipped. That if it wasn't for Jesus, she, would, she, she really wouldn't ever be known. She was immortal. She lived and she died, and she's not God, she's not Jesus, and she's not worthy to be worshipped or prayed to, nor can she answer prayer. I say this, ladies, not to offend you, because I have to tell you, I was Catholic, and I prayed my rosary twice a day, and I said the Hail Mary twice a day, and when I got married, I bowed at the statue of Mary as I was giving up my virginity to my husband, and I, we weren't saved, Phil and I. We were in the Catholic Church when we got married. And so I, I kneeled at that statue because that's what I truly loved and believed. And as I got saved, I realized that, you know, Mary is a sweet, precious, chosen one. We don't want to lighten that, but we want to know what the Scripture says, and it's so clear here that Mary is an example of a woman who loved God and was waiting for her Redeemer, and God bestowed upon her the privilege of carrying the Messiah. You know, Mary had no glowing background that we know of. Her pa parents weren't ever mentioned in Scripture. She appears on the pages of Scripture as a young woman, like I said, probably a teenager, maybe like 14, that's what some commentators say. And after Mary heard the shepherd's story and the angel's message about her son 
In Luke 2, 19, she pondered these things in her heart. She also hid God's word in her heart and she meditated on it because when she spoke what's known as this magnificent, she used scripture, reciting it from memory with understanding, properly applying it as she praised the Lord. She obviously had studied and been taught the scripture. There are at least 15 scripture references cited in these 10 verses, Mary pours out of her heart to God's heart. Mary was not successful in the eyes of the world. She accepted God's plan to be a vessel to bring his son into the world, and God's word was in her heart and in her head, and it was on her tongue. And this knowledge gave her the courage to step into God's will and to give and give up all to follow God with a complete heart. It cost her dearly in the eyes of people. I mean, here she was pregnant without being married, and she was considered a fornicator. In John 8, 41, the Pharisees, when talking to Christ, called him the son of, of, of fornication. You know, I was thinking about that. I, just, I stopped in my devotions, and I asked the Lord, I'm like, Lord, can you give me a tongue that is wise and quiet? Because, well, you know, I mean, these things that we say sometimes that are on our minds that we don't even know the facts or the truth, they go out, they disperse, and they can last years in the life of somebody. You know, I was thinking about the, a couple of things that like were said about me or Pastor Phil through the years in ministry that weren't true. But the years go by and people still think that because what are when we speak words, they're very powerful. And so we have to be careful. And I was just I just had to stop there and think, wow, you know, after all that time, here's Jesus standing before the Pharisees and they're still calling him the son of a fornication. You know, so we have to be as women very careful about not to project what we think in some, that's of, about someone and say it. But anyway, she would be hunted down by those who wanted to murder her infant son. Think about Mary. Here she was chosen to carry the Redeemer, the Messiah, our Jesus, our Savior. And then she would be hunted down by those who wanted to murder him and then later suffered as she watched him at the foot of the cross. In the eyes of God, Mary was favored, chosen, and sought out. And she was blessed by him. And in this magnificent, Mary praises him who is mighty and has done great things for her. Truly, in God's eyes, Mary was successful. This young woman who had no, really, reputation, was chosen by God. I wrote myself some questions that I needed to think about, and I'm going to give them to you. Do you constantly do a heart check to see if you're walking in pride or humility? You know, pride is ugly. And it is so tiny, and it could just rear its ugly head. And sometimes we don't even see it. So my prayer was, Lord, I want to see if I have pride. Please humble me. I want to be a humble servant. I want to walk in humility at all times. Do you know scripture so well that you can recite it from memory with understanding, properly using it, keeping it in its context? Does God's word pour out of your heart to God's heart like Mary? Have you accepted God's plan for your life no matter what that plan may be? Whether you are a young mom busy with diapers and bottles or a teenager sitting here tonight feeling really alone in your world as you stand up for Jesus, or a parent of a prodigal, or a widower, or a caregiver,
have you accepted the lot appointed to you in this season of your life? Is God's word in your heart and in your head? Is God's word on your tongue? Have you given up all to follow Jesus with a complete heart? Or are you keeping back bits and pieces that you just don't want to give him? God wants all of us, every bit of us. He doesn't want bits and pieces or things we choose to give him, choose we don't want, things we don't want to give him, but he wants all of us. Does your love for Jesus cost you dearly in the eyes of the people that surround your life? It might. But can I encourage you? You keep on walking and talking about your Savior. I encourage you that it will. Your love for Jesus will cost you dearly. It might cost you dearly in your marriage. It might cost you dearly in your workplace. It might cost you dearly in whatever fill in the blank, but your love for Jesus needs to be number one. Mary goes on to say, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Oh, how mighty is our God. You know, we serve and we love a mighty God our God, I've said this over and over again, is a God with the uppercase G. He is the God who sits on the throne, who, who just incorporates and designates and arranges, and, and he's sovereign, and he's all-knowing, and he's all-sufficient, and he's all-wise, and he's justice, and he's truth, and he's mercy, and he's grace, on and on and on. He is mighty. And he has done great things for you and I. He's magnificent. Magnificent is defined as this. Impressively beautiful, elaborate, extravagant. Synonyms for magnificent are splendid, spectacular, grand, glorious, superb, majestic, Awesome, awe-inspiring, and breathtaking. Have you taken time in the last few weeks to think on the great things that God has done for you? How his mighty hand holds you and keeps you and cares for you? Do you tell others about the great things he has done? Just the other week, I was um, at work and I was sharing with a coworker. They had asked me about uh, my granddaughter, Aria, because they remember her birth and being two pounds, eight ounces and everything. And I was able to use that opportunity to tell them the great things that he has done for us through her life. And use the opportunities to tell people they need to hear that God does great things. And don't allow your circumstances to overshadow those great things. Because he has done great things for you. And if it's just one singular thing, it's that he was born and that he went from the cradle to the cross and received the crown for you and for me. And that's one great thing. That's all we need, ladies is that he saved us, that he came to save you and I. Because he is mighty, and mighty is defined as possessing great and impressive power and strength, nothing is impossible for him. Nothing. Nothing's impossible for him. Nothing is impossible for him. Maybe you have a scarred marriage. Maybe you're having trouble in your marriage. Nothing is impossible for the great and mighty and powerful God that we serve. Maybe your heart tonight as you sit here is hurting. For whatever reason it might be hurting, it's not impossible for him. The years maybe that you were abused, God can heal that. It is nothing is impossible with God. You've been praying for your prodigal for years. Nothing is impossible 
with God. Your strained relationships, nothing is impossible with God. Whatever it is you're facing this evening that seems hopeless or impossible or never changing, I want you, I want to encourage you to continue to surrender and relinquish it. Relinquish it. Because with God, nothing is impossible. He does great things. I just want to tell you, don't give up. Don't give in. And don't grow weary. You keep on loving your Jesus. You keep him as your focus and your joy. It will remain if you keep your focus. The angel reminded Mary in this same chapter. This chapter is so rich in historic, like fat, and amazing worship unto God. But in the same um, chapter in Luke, she, the angel reminded Mary that with God, nothing is impossible. And what was Mary's response when he said that? She said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, do to me according to your word. You see, when you trust his great might, you can't help to respond in surrendering to him. Mary goes on to proclaim in the same verse, this very same verse, holy is his name. There is a great awestruck reverence for all that God is on Mary's part. It, it, just, it, just, it just screams out in these verses. You know, holy defines who he is. It is who he is. Do you, this was my question to me, have a great awestruck reverence for your God? Do you have an awestruck reverence for him? He is a holy God. And I truly believe if we had more of an awestruck reverence for God, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we dress, the way we interact with people would be so different. Having that awareness, that awestruck awareness of the holy God in us. Are you walking close to his heart? Are you walking with him tonight? Or have you left him? Have you left your first love? Oh, he's crying out to you. He's a holy God. And we need to make time to think on his name, his holy name, his holy character. I think sometimes we forget that he is holy. Just saying the name of Jesus causes my heart to fill with love and a bit of a reverence. Just the name Jesus. I can't tell you, and I think I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. Sometimes when I'm beside myself and I'm feeling far from God, I just say the name of Jesus. I just say the name of Jesus. And it fills me with this awestruck reverence of him and who he is. It reminds me that I love and I walk with a holy Savior. And because of that, I want to reverence him. You know, God's name defines who he is. And Mary, in these ten verses, recalls who he is. And I'm going to read what she says in these ten verses. She says, he is the Lord. He is God. He is my Savior. He regards the humble because he's mighty. He is holy. He does great things for he is mercy. He is mercy. Not only does he show mercy, he is mercy. He's strong. He brings down the mighty and he exalts the lowly. He provides needs. He is a helper and he remembers his promises. In these 10 verses, Mary recalls who he is. In verse 50, she goes on to say, His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Now that she has said holy is his name, she's talking about the fearing of the Lord, which again, it's to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. And to, it's the beginning of wisdom. 
and he shows mercy to those who fear him. It's a promise. If you are a woman who fears the Lord and walking with him, he will show mercy. You know, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Don't you love that? That our God doesn't give us what we deserve? We have all sinned. No matter how wonderful we try to be, how good we try to be, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, when we surrender our lives over to his lordship, and he gives us heaven because of that, he shows us mercy. He gives us heaven. We don't deserve that, ladies. No one does. But he gives it because he's mer he is mercy. He is mercy. And I love that she goes on. And, he, and she goes on to say, from generation to generation, ladies, we need to give Jesus to our children. We need to share Jesus to the younger generation. And if you're younger here, there has to be someone younger than you that you can give Jesus to. We need to share the fear of the Lord with the women around us. And when we do, he will show mercy from generation to generation. She goes on to say, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You know, he shows strength with his arm of strength. His arm of strength, it's that same arm of strength. It's the right arm. It's the one closest to where Jesus is sitting. Jesus is sitting at his right hand, his right arm. His arm is powerful. His arm is not only mighty to save, but it is sweet and secure to hold you during those times in life. I think about how strong and how powerful his arm of strength is. And yet, in Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11, it says, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs with his arm, and he'll carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead those who are with young. He goes before us. He's our rear guard. He walks beside us. His arm of strength is there when we are weary and we are weak. He makes us strong. Aren't you glad he shows strength with this arm? Aren't you glad he does scatter the proud? You know, we don't have to worry about those who rise up like against us, whether it be at work or in our homes or whatever the situation within the church, it doesn't, it doesn't, we don't have to worry about that. God takes care of all that. We just need to be humble and walk humbly with him. Because Mary goes on to say, he's put down the mighty from their thrones and he exalts the lowly. And this is consistent throughout the scriptures. He is sovereign and he is mighty and he tears the proud and he raises the lowly and the humble. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Matthew 23.12 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. We don't walk in humility to get exalted. We walk in humility because when we go before this holy, mighty, majestic, magnificent God, I don't know about you, but it does take my breath away. It takes my breath away. And it humbles me that he would love me. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit, they will retain honor. James 4, 6, He gives more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And 1 Peter 5, 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under that mighty hand of God, that right hand, which is connected to that right arm of power, <laughs> 
Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he may exalt you in due time. God will never allow his children to walk too long in pride. He will humble us. <laughs> he will. So I'd rather just go before him and ask him to clean my pride out. <laughs> when I think of Mary, the one who was chosen to carry our Redeemer, my Savior, when I think of her, if I think of one word that can define her, it would be humility. And that's something that I glean from and I want. She was a woman who spoke very little and when she spoke, the word of God was on her tongue. She knew the word of God and that caused her to know the God of the word. Verse 53, she goes on to say, He's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. You know, he always satisfies the hungry with good things. He will always provide our needs when we are a child of his, always. Whatever that need may be, whether it be a physical need, a financial need, or a spiritual need, he provides and he satisfies and the things of this world, ladies, only satisfy momentarily. And they leave us wanting for more. Alcohol satisfies for the moment and leaves us wanting for more. Prescription drugs satisfy for the moment and leave us wanting for more. Pornography satisfies for the moment and leaves you wanting for more. And you can fill in the blanks that things of this world, they will tear us down. But only Jesus, only Jesus our Savior is the one that can fill and satisfy. He never leaves us wanting for more, never. Psalm 81, 10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Are you needing whatever it is you need? He will fill. He will satisfy. Do you hunger for more of God? Oh, how I pray that you do. I have prayed over your names. Poor Kathy, I keep asking her for the list. <laughs> it's because I'm praying over your names. Oh, how I pray that you will hunger for more of God, more than when you walked in here tonight. You're a woman who hunger for God. I know you are because you're here tonight. But I pray you hunger for more of God, that he will set you apart in a very unique way after you leave this place. And if you don't know Jesus, I pray you don't leave this place until you talk to someone here because you need him as your Savior. You need him. Oh, he satisfies. And Mary knew this. He fills the hungry with good things, and the rich he will send away empty. She goes on to say in verse 54 and 55, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. You know, Mary, again, knows from Scripture that God is a covenant-keeping God. He remembers his promises, and he keeps them. And I want you to know that, that your God is a covenant-keeping God, and he has promises for you, and he will keep those promises. You know, I think about when I remember someone or something, it's because I re I'm recalling I have them on my mind. I'm thinking on them. I'm mindful of them. And I think about that, and I think about God. He is mindful of you. He thinks upon you. He loves you. Second Chronicles 6, 14 and 15 says that the Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven or on earth like you, who keeps your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept 
what you promised for your servant David, my father, and you have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. 2 Corinthians 12, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. And it has been said that God's promises are like life preservers. They keep our souls from sinking in the sea of trouble. If you feel like you're sinking, you need to reach for the promises of God, for the word of God. You know, the power of any promise depends on that one person making the promise. This means you can trust in God's promises of provision, protection, peace, ultimate glory and goodness because of his character, because of his attributes. God is a God who cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the time began. You know, some scholars estimate that there are more than 8,000 promises found in the Bible. Do you believe what God has promised you, do you believe? I see that this Christmas season. Macy's is that big thing, do you believe? And it's really sweet and pretty, and you see the commercial, and you, know, you see the beautiful kids. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, do we believe in a God who came down from his throne in earthly flesh and was born in a stable because there was no room for him in the inn? Who went to the cross for you and I? Died and three days rose again from the dead so we could have eternal life. Do you believe? That's the season we're in. Do you believe in your Savior? Do you believe in your Messiah? Oh, that we would be awestruck by his birth and by his glory and by his holiness and by his sovereignty and by his cross. May we magnify the Lord. You know, there is no earthly possession that you or I can give him. The only thing we can give him is our heart, our life, and our love. Oh, how worthy is our God to be given special honor in our lives, in our hearts. How worthy is our God to be placed first on the throne of our heart. How worthy is our God to have our hearts fully, completely devoted to him. Is your heart lowly and humble so that God has a safe place to abide I encourage you to take the month of December to meditate on this song of praise in your devotions. Just, you know, we're December 3rd today, so you have kind of the whole month. Just take these verses and go through them in your devotions. And let me close with this quote. It's by Roy Leshen, and I love him. He wrote The Calvary Road. And that you would see Jesus. Wonderful, classic books that I always encourage women to read the classics, you know, because those are the ones. These new books going out today have so much heresy in them, I can't tell you. They look good, but, they, but they're not. Jesus Calling, um, all those, uh, they're just, they're heretic. Go to the old classics if you're going to go apart from your Bible. Get a classic. But Roy Lushen is really good. And I, I want to leave you with this. There is no one like Jesus. Truly our heart's greatest celebration at Christmas is to adore him, to seek him, to thank him, and to praise him. He is the pathway upon which we travel, the truth we seek to know, the life we so desperately need. His grace is greater than our arms can embrace. His beauty is more than our eyes can behold. And his love is deeper than our hearts can explore. May you cry out to your Savior. May you slow down. May you sit down. And may you go face down. Face down before your Savior, the Holy 
righteous Messiah Redeemer. Amen. Father God, we love you. We want more of you. We want to go deeper, Lord. We want to be women who walk in humility before you, Lord. That we will be just, our breath would be taken away by your holiness, by your majestic hand and your powerful right arm. Oh, Lord, may we be like Mary, where we are women of your word, that, we, that it is in our minds and in our hearts that we pour our hearts out to your heart about your word. May we be like Mary, that your word is on our tongue, Lord. That we will be women, Lord, who recall the great things you've done for us that we may glorify you. Father, I pray for those who are saved in this room, that you will set them apart all the more. And I pray for women who are here that don't know you, have never really fully given their lives over to you to be saved. I pray for them that they will, Lord, come to know you, that they will be on their knees, face down, seeking who you are. Oh, how we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.